So why is it that we're not always our best at first impressions? Why is it that sometimes we don't say hello to people, or we don't smile, or we don't somehow, we get a customer sat survey back, an honest impression from somebody that says, this person really wasn't that nice to me. Well, how did that ever happen? Because you're all good people, and you all, you know, want to do a good job. And it's because stuff's going on during the day, and, and the self is an interesting, uh, the self is an interesting study, if you've ever gotten into it, that we have 50,000 individual thoughts per day. 50,000. And, and most of them aren't even conscious. They're, like they're, they're, they're unconscious. Like when you, get on, when you get up in the morning, do you put your left sock on first or your right sock on first? Do you, know, do you even know? I know you don't care. I don't care either. But I'm going to bet you this. I'm going to bet you put the same sock on first every morning. And it's a decision. It's a small little decision, but it's a decision. And when you put the car in reverse to pull out of your parking spot, you look in the rearview mirror. But you don't think to look in the rearview mirror. You just do it, right? And we do a lot of this stuff. And, and behavioral psychologists call this reflexive. You know, we just do it. We don't really think about it. And that's the way a lot of our... Uh, habits are. And so when you have these 50,000 thoughts a day, uh, it's kind of important to understand how thoughts determine feelings and feelings determine behavior. So in your notes, uh, Sue, are you with us? We're going to uh, do some keystroking. And, and Sue can come on speaker, man. She can do a cameo. Sue, say hello if you're there, please. So in your notes, if you would... Uh, I'm here, yep. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Uh, would, you would you put up uh, Malcolm Gladwell talking to strangers and the book Outliers? Outliers, oh, we'll worry about spelling later, but Outliers is the 10,000 hours piece. Oh, by the way, the 10,000 hours. So let's do the math. If you work 2,000 hours a year, and that's... Um, 50 weeks a year times 40 hours a week, right? That's 2,000 hours. And you do that for five years, and you're, you're conscious of your job. You're not just showing up and going through the motions. You are what Malcolm Gladwell and this other more obscure scientist, that's where the actual number came from, says you're an expert because you've logged 10,000 hours. That's five years, 2,000 hours a year. And you're an expert at what you do. But if you ask most people, if I had asked you before I gave you that big, long explanation, are you an expert at what you do? Are you an expert at, in, your, in your department? You might not have said yes. But according to the numbers, you are. You're an expert. So 10,000 hours equals expert, Sue. And then in your notes, would you do this for me? I need you to write this down because we're going to keep referring to it, and I want you to have a visual of how this works. It's a, um, we're going to put three components on the screen, Sue. On the left side, think, uh, let's, let's put thoughts, thoughts, and then there's an arrow, like you could do that little sideways arrow that points to the middle, there you go, and the middle is uh, emotion, and then the, on the right side is behavior. And the reason this is important is because of a guy by the name of Albert Ellis, E-L-L-I-S, Sue, if you would, Albert Ellis. He's, he's gone now, dead. But he uh, discovered something called REBT, which stands for Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. There is no quiz on this crap. Just telling you where it comes from. So simply put, Albert Ellis said that what we think about likely determines how we feel. What we think about determines how we feel. Think about politics. Think about whether or not you like to wear a mask. Think about um, your attitude about certain movie stars. We were talking about famous people. Whether or not you like country music. You know, what you think about country music determines how you feel about country music, right? And then Ellis said the natural extension of that is that how you feel determines how you behave. 
Make sense? It's a pretty simple equation. I don't know if you ever broke it down like that before. But it really puts an accent on thinking, which is why we send kids to school, which is why we worry about kids that haven't been in school for this two-year period, probably going to be a two-year period, what happens when kids miss seventh and eighth grade. If they, if they don't think, how will they feel, and then how will they behave when they join the workforce later on? All these things are on the minds of social scientists right now. And so when Ellis talks about this, this relationship between thoughts, emotion, and behavior, he's a big fan, of course, of getting educated and really understanding life, because when you understand life, you'll feel better about it, and when you feel better about it, you act accordingly, right? And then you make fewer uh, mistakes with your behavior. Think about something as um, simple as drinking and driving. And Gladwell talks about this in the book, um, Talking to Strangers. He talks about alcohol, how alcohol actually affects the brain. I learned a bunch of stuff about this. You, you know, you have one drink, and the alcohol is in the front of the brain, you know, the cerebellum. And you might, you might if you drank too fast because, you know, you deserve this long, couple long slugs, you haven't seen your mates for a while, and then you stand up, you haven't eaten anything, right? and you stand up and you're a little wobbly, right? That's the first part of alcohol. The second part of alcohol is uh, it starts to move its way back into the brain, into the hippocampus, and then you start to enter, uh, if you have enough to drink, you enter a blackout stage. I mean, so there's like this progression, the more you drink. But if you don't understand this, and, and because you didn't think about it, He's like, well, I can just have another drink. You know, I feel like having, I feel like having another cocktail, right? And then uh, I, I spent a lot of time in bars growing up. I watched more people finish their drinks. Why? So they could get in the car and drive home. Bizarre. Who in their right mind would do this? Slam down a drink because we don't want to waste it so we can get in the car and drive home. And that's exactly what we do. And then you meet these guys. Thoughts determine... Emotion, emotion determines behavior. That's just one example. My favorite book of all time, I do a lot of reading, is called Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely, A-R-I-E-L-Y. And if you like this psychology stuff and how, how life really works, you'll love this book. The premise of the book is this. That as smart as we are, as smart as you are, and you are, and you are, and you are, we not only make mistakes that aren't in our best, we do stuff that's not in our best interest, we do it in a pattern. We do it over and over again. Where somebody from outer space would just look at this and say, what, what's the matter with these people? You know, why do they do that? But it's just, just how habits work. And it's all based in, in, in this relationship between thoughts and emotion and behavior. So here's where it really gets messed up. That's where it really gets interesting. Is that because we have this system for processing thoughts, right, and how it plays out in our emotion and our behavior, two, things, two interesting things start to happen. The first thing is we see stuff, we think we see stuff that's not really there. We think we see stuff that's not really there. I'll give you some examples. Um, lottery ticket. You know, you think you're going to win. But statistically speaking, you're not going to win at all. And if you do, it'll just be a couple of dollars, right? It's like they say in Vegas, the house always wins. So you think you see the big prize, but the prize isn't there at all. You think you see it, but it's not really there. Um, second example. Um, you're at a, a counter for customer service and you think you're getting shabby treatment or you're on a help desk on a phone with somebody and you're getting not treated well. You think you're being slighted, but you're not being slighted at all. You, you've imagined it and now you're going to write them up, you know, you're going to s- complain, right? And they, just were do- they were just doing their best. So we see stuff that's not there and here's the second thing that happens. We don't see stuff that is there. That back to us being not as observant as we think we are. And I'll give you some examples of that as well. 
bad habits. We have, all of us, me included, we have habits that don't serve us. But I think I'm okay with it. Um, eating late at night, and then I don't sleep well. Why do I do that to myself? I just do. I know better. I can't stop. I'm watching a movie with a redhead, and I eat, I eat too much popcorn or whatever, and then I'm in bed, and I'm like, why did I do that? So bad habits is one example. Um, a second example is when you're misled. Like somebody tells you something, and, you're, and you really admire this person, and you go, well, yeah, if he said it, that must be true. So you're seeing something that's not there. It's not true, and that happens all the time. And it's fascinating. 